Chapter 11, Patronage and Punishment. Zion's camp was Joseph Smith's second major failure, yet it was of much profit to him. First-hand acquaintance with the ferocity of anti-Mormonism shocked him into a policy of prudence and conciliation, which won him several years of peace. This period he utilized to advantage in welding his priesthood into a phalanx strong enough to withstand the terrific onslaughts of apostasy and civil strife that came later. Zion's camp seems also to, uh, also to have heightened his sense of accountability towards his own people. When the terrified Heber Kimball watched his friend seized with cholera convulsions in Missouri, he vowed secretly that he would never sin again. And though Joseph's journal contained no such ingenuous resolution, it is clear that he too was overwhelmed with anguish and humility. Houses had been burned, men had been beaten and stoned, women and men had died from exposure and disease, all in his name. Missouri hate had been spent, not against himself, but against his people and the gospel to which they clung with such selfish devotion. The gospel was now a force outside himself, a force that he might help guide but could never again wholly control. He now sensed that he must no longer give out revelations for the incidental occasion. Thus saith the Lord was a trumpet call not to be weakened by too ready use. During the next ten years, therefore, he dictated scarcely more than a dozen revelations, although in the previous five-year period he had given out more than a hundred. Just as his stature as a religious leader had been enhanced by discarding the seer stones in favor of the revelation, so now it was further increased by his reliance on the authority of his own teachings rather than on, upon the ubiquitous and uncompromising direction of God. Upon his return from Missouri, Joseph faced an acute crisis. Far from being a second Moses, he had left the exiled colony still outside the promised land and had returned with little except consoling words for the families of the fourteen dead. Kirtland met him with a hostility that exceeded his worst fears, for Sylvester Smith had rushed back with a dismal story of defeat without honor. I was met, Joseph wrote in his journal, with a catalog of charges as black as the author of lies himself, and the cry was, tyrant, pope, king, usurper, abuser of men, angel, false prophet, prophesying lies in, in the name of the Lord, taking consecrated monies and every other lie to fill up and complete the catalog. He faced the charges in a council meeting, arguing without respite an hour after hour until his mild voice was hoarse and his face was lined with weariness. Innuendos concerning the mishandling of funds he met by calling for reports from several commissaries who defended him earnestly. Then he retold the story of his quarrels with Sylvester Smith, deftly turning the man's heated accusations till they seared Sylvester more than they had ever burned himself. Finally, after six hours, the man began to stammer an apology, and Joseph relaxed, victorious and spent. Once this crisis was passed, Joseph set about assuaging the feeling of frustration that followed the failure of Zion's camp. He had promised his men a great endowment in the temple, and now bent his tremendous energy and enthusiasm toward completion of that structure. Before long, the temple became a symbol of hope and anticipation, almost displacing the symbol of Zion. Those who had property mortgaged it to buy lumber and plaster. The poor gave of their own sweat. All converts who stopped in Kirtland on the way to Missouri were reminded that Joseph would remain in bondage until the Kirtland Temple was finished. When John Tanner, who had just sold two farms and 2,200 acres of timber, visited Kirtland in January 1835 and learned that the temple mortgage was about to be foreclosed, he canceled his plans to go to Missouri, loaned the temple committee $13,000, signed a note with its profit for $30,000 worth of goods, and gave Joseph an additional personal loan of $2,000. Nine years later, Tanner handed the prophet the personal note. What would you have me do with it? Joseph asked him, and Tanner replied, Brother Joseph, you are welcome to it. Such open-handedness Joseph loyally repaid with positions in his ever-expanding hierarchy. He wrote, quite frankly, in his journal that Joseph Boosinger was ordained to the high priesthood in consequence of his having administered unto us in temporal things in our distress. There were no men, however, to whom he felt so indebted as the members of Zion's camp. These were tested saints, deserving of rank. In the spring of 1835, when he enlarged his priesthood to include twelve apostles and a special quorum of seventy men, Nine of the apostles and all of the seventies were members of his army. Zion's camp had taught Joseph something of the mistrust of autocratic power that pervaded Yankee thinking. He had already taken care to change his own title from first elder to president of the high priesthood. President was not a New Testament word, 
as were all other ranks in his priesthood, but in the early bloom of this republic it had tremendous prestige plus a connotation of responsibility to the people. The church was now governed by five councils, the Presidency, the Apostles, the Seventies, and the two high councils of Kirtland and Missouri. A revelation gave them all equal authority. Noting this, the discerning John Coral wrote with satisfaction, I saw that there were several different bodies that had equal power. I thought, therefore, they would serve as a check upon each other, and I concluded there was no danger when the full power and authority was reserved to the people. Soon, however, a rivalry sprang up among the five bodies. The apostles, who were Joseph's favorite and the ablest men, quickly garnered so much power that the Kirtland High Council protested that they were setting themselves up as an independent council subject to no authority of the church, a kind of outlaws. The twelve, however, listened to no one but their prophet. They were virile men, with the tough and arrogant strength of youth. None was over thirty-six. Four were only twenty-four. Joseph himself was still under thirty. The poet-journalist W.W. Phelps coined in one idle hour a sobriquet for the, each of the twelve. Brigham Young he styled appropriately the Lion of the Lord. The studious Orson Pratty called the Gage of Philosophy. And his great prose, proselyting brother Parley, the Archer of Paradise. Lyman White, the rampageous general of Zion's camp, became the Wild Ram of the Mountains. These happy epithets stuck to the men for life. The constant jockeying for power among the council soon made it clear to Joseph that equality was impossible. The duty of the president, he finally decreed, is to preside over the whole church and to be like unto Moses. Once more his word was the law of God, against which there could be no appeal. Soon it was officially announced that an insult to Joseph would be considered an insult to the whole body, and then the high council saw to it that this rule was respected. Once, when Joseph requested a donation of $12 to pay for a record book, and Henry Green said privately that he thought the prophet was extorting more than the cost of the book, he was cut off from the church for the remark. Basically, therefore, the church organization remained autocratic. Only the trappings were democratic. The membership voted on the church officers twice a year, but there was only one slate of candidates, and it was selected by the first presidency, comprised of Joseph himself and his two counselors. Approval or disapproval was indicated by a standing vote in the general conference. Dissenting votes quickly became so rare that the elections came to be called, and the irony was unconscious, the sustaining of the authorities. Joseph was particularly generous with positions to members of his own family. His father was made patriarch of the church. Hiram early replaced F.G. Williams as the third man in the presidency, along with Joseph and Rigdon. Don Carlos Smith although only 19, was appointed president of the high priests, and Samuel Smith became general agent for the literary firm, which supervised all the church publications. The church accepted the prophet's nepotism without resentment until he made his brother William an apostle. Hiram was a gentle, self-effacing person whose loyalty to Joseph already was proverbial. Samuel and Don Carlos were silent and industrious, but William, a gaunt, raw-boned, cadaverous-looking youth, possessed none of his brother's gracious qualities. He was lusty, hot-tempered, and always in debt. Oliver Cowdery pronounced the apostolic blessing over his head with great misgivings. We pray that we may be purified in heart, that he may be equal with his brethren. Soon William brought a complaint against the father for beating his 15-year-old daughter, and Joseph, suspecting William's concern to be more amatory than humanitarian, sided with the parents. William, in a towering rage, resigned his apostleship and went up and down the Kirtland streets exclaiming against his brother. The saints were mortified, and the Gentiles grinned to hear him. The other apostles, who would have been pleased to see him excommunicated altogether, were bitterly opposed to his reinstatement to the quorum. But William had now poisoned Samuel's mind, and Joseph could ill afford two apostate brothers. Finally, he was forced to resort to a revelation to convince the angry apostles that his brother must be forgiven. As for my servant William, let the eleven humble themselves in prayer and in faith, and wait on me in patience, and my servant William shall return, and I will yet make him a polished shaft in my quiver, in bringing down the wickedness and abominations of men, and there shall be none mightier than he in this day and generation. Using the whip upon the apostles rather than upon his brother was a mistake, for William came back into office more impertinent than before. 
He organized a debating society which soon became notorious for malicious and carping criticism. Joseph walked into a meeting of the society one night at William's home and reproached him for the tenor of the discussion. William replied with the stream of abuse. Elder Smith, who lived in the same house, listened to the quarrel in shocked silence until William called Joseph a tyrant and impostor. Then he intervened, thundering for an end to the scene. Joseph bowed in assent and made for the door, but William was not so easily stopped. "'I'll say what I please in my own house,' he shouted. Joseph whirled back, remembering well the credit and charity he had doled out whenever William pleaded need. "'Then I will speak too,' he cried, "'for I built this house, and it is as much mine as yours.' At this, William lunged at him, but Joseph flung his coat to free his arms for defense. William was too quick, caught him off guard, and sent him crashing to the floor. There he pummeled him mercilessly until Hiram succeeded in dragging him off. The fight shocked the church. The faithful shook their heads in despair that Joseph should be so cursed in his own family and mournfully revived the gossip about another battle which had occurred earlier that same summer. Calvin Stoddard, Joseph's brother-in-law, had accused Joseph of depriving him of some water rights. In the ensuing quarrel, Stoddard had called him a damn false prophet, and Joseph had promptly knocked him down. Stoddard brought suit for assault, but by the time the case came to court, he had mellowed sufficiently to forgive the prophet publicly, and the judge duly handed down a verdict of, of acquittal. What, troubled, what most troubled the converts about these family quarrels was that both Stoddard and William Smith had called Joseph a false prophet. This was both heresy and a gross offense against decorum. If they honestly doubted Joseph, theirs should be the decency to at least keep silent and not gratify the Gentiles. The faithful said unhappily, A prophet is not without honor save in his own family. No one in Kirtland was more incensed at William than his own fellow apostles, who now forced his resignation. This Joseph fought. William's thrashing had crippled him for day several days and was a stinging slap at his pride, for he was vain of his wrestling prowess. But the unity of his family was one of the cornerstones upon which he had built his career, and except for William it had been a rugged stone. The thought of its cracking caused all hurt of injured dignity to vanish. I freely forgive you, he wrote to William in a letter that was shortly made public, and you know my unshaken, unchangeable disposition. I know in whom I trust. I stand upon the rock. The floods cannot, no, they shall not overthrow me. You know the doctrine I teach is true. You know that God has blessed me. I brought salvation to my father's house as an instrument in the hands of the Lord when they were in a miserable situation. And if at any time you should consider me to be an impostor, for heaven's sake, leave me in the hands of God and think not to take vengeance on me yourself. Tyranny, usurpation, and to take men's rights ever has been and ever shall be banished from my heart. David sought not to kill Saul, although he was guilty of crimes that never entered my heart. William finally made a public confession before the High Council and Congregation and thus escaped an ecclesiastical trial. Joseph usually tried to conciliate his foes rather than bludgeon them out of his church. His only whip was the public confession, a stinging weapon in its own right, but one designed to have the opposite effect of an excommunication. The mere threat of such a confession was usually sufficient to curb delinquents, but with William the pain of confession was, a tra was transient. He never ceased being a thorn. At no time in Joseph Smith's career was he more at peace with the world than in the three years following the March of Zion's camp. There was nothing for his people to argue except theology, and nothing to oppose except indiscretions in the manners and morals of the young. The official history of the church in these years consists largely of a series of ecclesiastical trials for sexual misbehavior, misbehavior whiskey drinking, and heresy. The High Council was bent on banishing liquor more than anything else, more than even adultery. Ohio now was an engulfed in a rising tide of temperance, agi temperance agitation. In 1834, there were 5,000 temperance societies in the United States, with a membership of over a million. 90% of these lived north of the Mason-Dixon line, and the majority were concentrated in New York and Ohio. After 1836, when the American Temperance Society adopted total abstinence in its platform, there was scarcely a Protestant preacher on the Western Reserve who had not taken the pledge. The lesser stimulants were likewise abused. Tobacco was called a nerve-prostrating, soul-paralyzing drug, a fleshly, ungodly lust. Coffee was deplored as an exitance to amorousness, and tea drinking was thought to be as bad as toddy guzzling. Food fads and alcoholic cures periodically swept the nation. The popular Journal of Health, published from 1829 to 1835, 
held that sparing use of meat was responsible for the robustness of the Irish and recommended a vegetarian diet. Self-denial was nowhere more fashionable than among the minor sects. In 1833, Joseph dictated a revelation called the Word of Wisdom, which today is best known of all he ever wrote. It suggested that church members abstain from tobacco, alcohol, and hot drinks, that they would only use wine at communion and meat only in winter. Joseph made it clear, however, that the revelation was given not by commandment or constraint, but merely as good counsel. He was only deferring to the pressure of the times, for he was too fond of earthly pleasures to become a temperance crusader. The exact circumstances that stimulated this revelation were later described by Brigham Young. Joseph's leading men met regularly, he said, in a room above the prophet's kitchen. Emma complained bitterly after each gathering about having to clean so filthy a floor, for the first thing they did was to light their pipes and, while smoking, talk about the great things of the kingdom and spit all over the room. This made the prophet think about the matter, and he inquired of the Lord relating to the conduct of the elders in using tobacco, and the revelation known as the word of wisdom was the result of his inquiry. For some years, in fact, Joseph did not take his word of wisdom seriously. After a double wedding in January 1836, he wrote in his journal, We then partook of some refreshments, and our hearts were made glad with the fruit of the vine. This is according to the pattern set by our Savior himself, and we feel disposed to patronize all the institutions of heaven. A fortnight later, at the marriage of his apostle John Boynton, he was presented with three servers of glasses filled with wine to bless. And it fell to my lot to attend this duty, he said, which I cheerfully discharged. Our hearts were made glad while partaking of the bounty of the earth which was presented, until we had taken our fill, and joy filled every bosom. When the High Council took it upon itself to enforce the word of wisdom, going so far in February 1834 as to rule that disobedience was sufficient grounds for depriving a man of his office, the Prophet's cavalier behavior was a grave embarrassment. Alman Babbitt, brought to trial for drinking, defended himself by saying that he knew it was wrong, but he was only following the example of President Joseph Smith. By the end of the year, however, the pressure had become too much for Joseph Rigdon. For Joseph. Rigdon, a fanatical temperance enthusiast, on December 4, 1836, forced through a vote for total abstinence. Joseph bowed to public opinion, replaced wine with water in the communion, and let the High Council do its worst. The revelation eventually evolved into a great moral issue, the use of tea, coffee, tobacco, and alcoholic liquors becoming to every good Mormon the badge of the heretic and the unrighteous.